On land in the neighborhood of Tilly sur seul British forces open a fierce attack at dawn. British reinforcements moving up to the car area, where some of the bitterest fighting yet seen in the campaign has taken place. My name is Clément Arvat, and I'm a French World War II history buff specializing in wartime correspondence. For almost two decades, as a hobby, I have collected frontline letters and personal souvenirs from Allied soldiers. For each one of them, I have researched their stories in the archives, and after I tried to reach out to their descendants all over the world, I've paid tribute to them in my award-winning book, Till Victory. I'm constantly looking for new inspiring stories to tell, to honor the sacrifice of those who liberated my country, and to send a message of peace to the younger generations. One day, while doing my morning routine of going through my favorite listings on a popular auction website, I found a letter, written in 1944 in North Africa, by a British soldier mentioning his nephew, Joe. All he said was that Joe was missing in action somewhere in France, but that he was certain he was safe. Although I didn't know either of them, I was deeply moved by this soldier's optimistic tone and simply asked myself, 77 years after that letter was sent, was Joe safe, really? My curiosity got the better of me and I embarked on a long and fascinating investigation. I dug for clues buried in the archives and looked for the visible scars of the war on the former battlefields. Voyez là en haut là il y a une croix. Et le côté droit a disparu, c'est les soldats anglais qui sont exercés au tir. I interviewed witnesses and traveled through time in a quest that proved to be more complex than it looked. This is the story of Joe and an insight into the research work that led to the discovery of an individual soldier's fate. Who was he? And what unit did he serve with? Did he make it home alive eventually? What happened to him? I want to know. I acquired all the letters I could. A few days went by and I got them all in the mail. I already had a few clues to work with. First, the sender's address and the recipients. It was enough to identify the soldier writing the letters. North Africa, summer of 1944. Lance Corporal James Brown used to be a signalman in the Royal Artillery who took part in the British 8th Army's campaign from El Alamein to Tripoli, during which he was wounded in the leg and sent to hospital. He did not return to combat, but joined the signal section of Force 133, a codename for the SOE or Special Operations Executives HQ in Cairo, Egypt. From there, he followed the recent developments in Normandy where his nephew, Joe, was fighting. He wrote to his sister, Jean, Joe's mother, living in Salford, Lancashire, a city close to Manchester, on the 9th of July, 1944. I hope that you're not having any trouble from the flying bombs. Jerry is a lousy blighter. He knows that this form of attack against the women and children of Britain cannot bring him victory, but he hopes to save something from the mess by using it. Well, I have a good idea that the new boys in Normandy will be made into old-timers overnight by the knowledge that he is doing this and he is only hasting his own end. Jerry seems to have slipped up badly in his countermeasures to the invasion. He is now taking crack troops from the Eastern Front to try and hold our men in the West. We know from past experience that Jerry is no fool in military matters, but yet he was very badly out in his calculations somewhere. He has had a long time to build up his defences, and he thought he could beat off any attempt of an invasion, and yet our boys and the Yanks have pushed the lot over. Well, I think he made his mistakes in judging our men. Have you heard any more from the boys? 
Last I had is that you'd received a field card from Nat. The boys. Hmm. All I learned from this letter was that he had more than one nephew fighting in France by that point, and that one of them was named Nat. James' next letter, written on the 3rd of August, would provide more clues and mention Joe being missing for the first time. I told you that if they did not confirm Joe's death within a reasonable time, that he would have been a prisoner. I've now learned from Betty's letter that it happened on June 28th. By the time you've received this, about six weeks would have passed. And if you have had no confirmation, it is practically certain that he is a prisoner because the area lost at the time has been regained a while back. And I wish I could get to her and you to make you realize how certain I am that Joe is safe. She also told me that you had received letters from Jim and Nat and that they were okay. How I wish I could be with them instead of wasting my time here. But I will meet them again one day. Joe too. The war seems to be going better now and even old Churchill's optimistic about an early finish. But it can't be over too soon. Write to Betty and point out to her what I've told you. And write also to Jim and Nat who are on the spot and can verify all I have told you. So cheer up until you learn, as I'm sure you will, that Joe is a prisoner. Write soon and God bless you all. According to this letter, James had three nephews, Jim, Joe and Nat, who had apparently landed on or after D-Day. Later, I will learn from the family that Jim and Nathaniel were both paratroopers in the 6th Airborne Division and they jumped on Normandy on the morning of June 6th. They relieved the glider-borne troops that had captured the bridges across the Orne River and took part in the defensive battles around Breville. They were both okay, but the family was concerned about the status of the elder brother, Joe. One piece of information was critical to his identification. His sister Betty, who served in Egypt with the ATS, the female branch of the British Army, was notified that Joe was missing in action on June 28th. First, I decided to take the optimistic route, just like James, and I tried to search for a Joseph Hewitt in the database for British prisoners of war, using the date of the supposed capture. No result matched. So I did a similar search on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission's website, and I was shocked to discover that a soldier named Joseph Hewitt was killed on June 28th. As part of the 10th Battalion, Highland Light Infantry, he died in Normandy, which would fit the profile. Although his name is actually very common in the UK and not much useful information was held by the Graves Commission, not even his age, his service number could confirm I had found the right man. Since 1920, each British regiment was allocated its own block of numbers and the soldier's number was in the range corresponding to the Manchester Regiment. It meant that before being transferred to the 10th Battalion of the Highland Light Infantry Regiment, the unit appearing on his grave, this man joined his local regiment in Manchester. That's right, the same area James' sister was living in. A long search on genealogy websites confirmed the identification for good. This Joseph Hewitt, born in 1920, had two brothers, Nat and Jim, and a sister, Betty. I even found his uncle, James Brown, the author of the letters in my possession. On this same genealogy website, I found uh, one of Joe's distant relatives and he actually sent me a full list of all the children in the Hewitt family. So here you have Joe, born on January 6, 1920. James Brown, um, who is the author of the letters. Uh, not to be confused with Joe's brother, James Brown Hewitt, uh, who is the paratrooper. Um, and the other brother, Nat, here. Um, they're a bit younger than Joe. Um, he had other brothers like George and Francis and sisters like Jean and Betty right here. Betty, Elizabeth, Reed, Hewitt, uh, the ATS. They were all there, which does confirm that this Joseph Hewitt is the right Joe. 
My excitement quickly turned into a sad and bitter feeling, however. Because I had my answer. Joe had in fact been killed in action, age only 24 years old. Those letters, full of hope, became painful to read. Poor James had no idea his nephew was dead. But how come no one was informed of his death weeks after Joe was listed as missing in action? What happened to him? I had to investigate and dig into his unit's history using a large collection of reference books. The battalion's war diary pulled up from the archives and wartime military maps. I was able to track Joe's whereabouts during his final hours. I made sure the area looked exactly the same back then as it does today, using air photographs from 1945 on which I could clearly see foxholes, shell craters and even wrecks of tanks. Then I packed up and drove to Normandy to study the terrain and look for clues where the action took place 77 years earlier. Joe was assigned to the 10th Battalion of the Highland Light Infantry, a Scottish regiment formed in 1881 with elements of even older Highland regiments such as the 71st Light Infantry and the 74th Regiment of Foot. It drew its recruits mainly from Glasgow and the Scottish Lowlands. I've just made a quick stop in Scotland to visit the Royal Highland Fusiliers Museum uh, in Glasgow because the Highland Light Infantry merged with this regiment back in the 60s. It covers the whole history of both regiments um, which have been around for uh, several centuries. Um, unfortunately, they had nothing on show. Uh, they told me to contact the Ministry of Defense, uh, but of course the COVID situation makes everything um, much more difficult. However, I managed to track down some of Joe's relatives, and although to this day they still don't know what happened to him, they uh, found this beautiful photo of Joe, um, which I have yet to restore and colorize. It's nice to finally put a face to his name, but I still have so many unanswered questions. Anyway, I, I learned quite a lot here about the long history of the 10th Highland Light Infantry. And look what I found at a flea market here. Uh, I found this uh, original uh, cap badge for uh, the Highland Light Infantry. You can see uh, the Imperial Crown here, uh, the initials HLI. Uh, the bugle horn of the Light Infantry Regiments and the word Asai with an elephant for the battle the regiment won in India in 1803. I told you the Highland Light Infantry had a long history. With the 2nd Battalion of the Gordon Highlanders and the 2nd Battalion of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, they formed the 227th Highland Infantry Brigade attached to the 15th Scottish Division. Even though he only had distant family roots in Scotland, an Englishman like Joe joining a Scottish regiment was no longer unusual in 1944. The war and the great need for recruits had shaken the traditions and organization of the British Army and Englishmen, Scots, Irish, Welsh and troops from other dominions and colonies of the Commonwealth often served together in British units. The situation would only get worse since on D-Day already, the pool of British infantry reserves was extremely limited with only 38,000 replacements. The Normandy bloodbath would cost General Montgomery more than 2,000 men a day. When the rare replacements arrived in France, Officers were told that once they reached their unit, their life expectancy would be no more than three weeks. David Milchrist, a 97-year-old British veteran now living in France, was one of them. He lied about his age to join the army at 17 after his best friend died in the sinking of HMS Hood. They crossed the channel for the first time to go to France. What, what did you think about? Were you scared? Excited. No, I wasn't scared. I was scared because the, the sea was pretty rough and quite a number of my soldiers, I was with a draft of soldiers I've never seen before. We left New Haven about six o'clock in the evening, six days after D-Day. And my horror was being sent down below on a landing craft infantry 
because I've always suffered terribly from claustrophobia. And that was the worst part, wondering if I was going to be sick or not, <laughs> and being enclosed. If we hit a mine or something, there was no chance of getting out. So I wasn't scared, I was excited. I was scared of being confined because for six months I never saw a bed. I only once slept in a barn with straw. Otherwise, six months was in a hole in the ground. Mm. No, my ambition was to see Nazi Germany beaten and France. I'd never been to France before. It was just an honor to be in France and to think that we were part of the liberator force with the Americans and the Allies, the Belgians, the Scandinavians, the Hollandaise. It was a great experience. Since the start of Operation Overlord on June 6, 1944, the Allies had managed to establish a bridgehead along the 50-mile stretch of the Normandy coast from the American Utah Beach in the Cotentin Peninsula to the British Sword Beach by the Orne River near Caen and to push a dozen miles inland. By the end of June, Cherbourg had fallen to the Americans, now progressing towards Saint-Lô. Meanwhile, Caen, which was the 3rd British Infantry Division's objective for D-Day, was still in German hands. Hitler's finest panzer units were rushed to defend the area, including the infamous 12th SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend, responsible for several war crimes, such as the Asked Massacre of French civilians and the shooting of Canadian prisoners of war in the Abbey Darden. There, 20 men, mostly from the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, were shot in the back of the head, despite being protected by the Geneva Convention. This armored division of the Waffen-SS has thrown the majority of its junior enlisted men from members of the Hitler Youth, and their young age and Nazi indoctrination made them fierce fighters. In late June, they would inflict more than 50% casualties on Scottish infantry battalions. David Milchrist would be assigned to the 4th Somerset Light Infantry in the 43rd Wessex Division. He would fight alongside Joe's 15th Scottish Division and experience the same awful conditions against their common ruthless enemy. Well, today uh, the Norman countryside is a uh, very beautiful and peaceful place, but what was it like in 1944? It was terrible. Uh, it was, when I say it was terrible, it was um, hard to explain. For example, you might fight for 24 hours and gain half a kilometer. You might destroy a farm with their cattle. Most of the horse had been claimed by the German army, the Wehrmacht. And it was incredible. The one thing, if you liberated the farm, you were immediately thanked. The farmhouse might be on flames, all the cattle dead. And it was quite extraordinary. Always the word, thank you, we are liberated. And it was a great experience, which gave one courage. I remember one farm, I was given a glass of Calvados mixed with hot milk from a cow that hadn't been killed. And I was um, pretty drunk for 24 hours afterwards. I'd never had Calvados before. Mm. The Battle of the Bocage was the worst because every hedge was um, uh, defended by some machine guns and um, tier elite snipers. And um, I took a patrol to find out where the Germans were and uh, we were creeping down a hedgerow in these so few mines which the Germans used, which were buried. And if you walked on it, it shot into the air and then exploded. And I was creeping on my hands and knees. I felt something um, piercing my... It was a shoe gun that didn't go off. That's a, one of my many escapes, which is incredible that yeah. I lasted for so long. Oh. What, what it was it like for you? Were you scared, uh, even though you trained for many years? No, it's funny enough, I, I don't ever remember being scared. I was always worried that there was something would go wrong, or how could I avoid killing somebody? 
I never expected to survive the war, except for the fact that I, I only hoped that I would be killed and not maimed for life. That was my one ambition, to see the end of the war, but not as um, uh, maimed for life. I'd rather be dead. And when I was wounded, um, that was completely different. I thought, my God, I'm still alive. <laughs> Joe and most of the Highlanders had landed in Normandy on the 18th of June at courcelles sur mer the beach they set foot on. Come named Juno, had been the Canadian D-Day landing site and the scene of very violent fighting. As its baptism of fire, the 10th Island Light Infantry was to take part with the 15th Scottish Division in Operation Epsom, also known as the First Battle of the Odon, on the 26th of June 1944. It had been delayed by a terrible storm that partially destroyed the Allied ports, bringing in men and supplies. These prefabricated structures, which were transported across the channel and assembled to form the so-called Mulberry Harbors, can still be seen at Aromanche. The plan of Operation Epsom was to break out of the bridgehead west of Caen, cross the Orne River and capture the high ground south of the city. The British 49th West Riding Division reached fontenay le penel on the first day and the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division made good progress towards saint mont vieux -Noray. In between, more than 60,000 men and 600 tanks from 8th Corps were marching to their start line near Cheux. The infantry was supported by fire from hundreds of artillery guns, Royal Navy battleships and 250 Royal Air Force bombers, although handicapped by low clouds and mist. The second Glasgow Highlanders were to take the village at the cost of nearly 200 men closely followed by the rest of Joe's 15th Scottish Division, the British 43rd Wessex Infantry Division and the 11th Armoured Division. On a former Epsom battlefield stands a memorial to the 15th Scottish Division. I thought it would be an appropriate place to meet with my friend Jeff Rosie, whose grandfather actually fought in the same battalion as Joe. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the battalion? Of course, yes. Uh, the um, 10th Battalion Highland Light Infantry uh, is a battalion that fought throughout the First World War, was disbanded at the end of the war and called up for, for service again, of course, in the Second World War. Originally was held back for home service to stay in England, but eventually the decision was made that the unit would move to France and they formed part of uh, 227th Infantry Brigade of the 15th Scottish Division. And, and what size was that unit, uh, a battalion? Well, uh, a battalion in the British Army of that time ranges between 800 and 850 men. They're a light infantry uh, battalion, so they are, they're made for quick response. So they had quick, light armoured vehicles, uh, light carriers. They, of course, they were mobile. They were mobile units, that's, that's the main thing. And what about the uniform? Can you tell us about um, the patches and, and the equipment that? Yeah, so uh, I brought I brought along this this uh, this original uniform. Uh, so yeah, I mean this is, represents, of course, uh, a soldier of the 10th Battalion, the High Line Infantry. So you've got the the cap badge here on the Mackenzie tartan. Uh, again here with the Mackenzie flash uh, denoting the 10th Battalion, the division patch of the 15th Infantry Division, and the three arm of service strips denoting. Um, 227th Infantry Brigade. And here he's patched up as a Lance Corporal, but Bren Carrier Crew. Like your grandfather. Just like my grandfather, yes. But my grandfather was a private. Yeah. <laughs> and what about all the kit? Most soldiers uh, landing in, in, in Normandy were kitted out virtually exactly like this, you know, in good old battle dress. Uh, this is a uniform that was designed on, on, on ski clothing from the 1930s. Um, not as practical as, as some uniforms, but you know, good world surge, keeps you warm. Um, you've got the 1937 web equipment, which is actually an equipment that's designed really around the use of the Bren gun. So every soldier would carry two magazines for the Bren gun, and in the other he would have his own bandolier, a couple of bandoliers and a couple of grenades. Another bandolier here holding 50 rounds of ammunition for his Lee Enfield rifle. You have the entrenching tool to dig into the ground to get out of, get into cover out the way of fire. Uh, you have the bayonet, of course, for the, uh, the spike bayonet for the Mark IV of Lee Enfield. 
Coming around the back here, you have his small pack with his ground sheet. That's for, you know, sleeping. That's all they have really is that just one sheet to, to sleep upon. Rubberized, so, so it keeps them moderately dry from the ground. In the small pack, you're carrying your dry ration, 24 hour ration. You're carrying a spare pair of socks. You're carrying a, a little jumper, a cap comforter, which is a little, little wool cap. Um, and your mess kit, of course, so knife, fork, spoon and, and, and mess kit. You've got your good old mug for your cup of tea, of course. Here you've got your anti-gas respirator. Of course, your water bottle. Water bottle is actually the water in this is only to be used on order. If you don't get the order to drink out of your water bottle, you're not supposed to use it. Okay. And uh, yeah, that, that, that sums up, you know, roughly uh, the, the, the you know, soldiers fighting within the infantry uh, in, in the British Army. Even though their uniforms and equipment are identical, most of the photos taken during Operation Epsom are of the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers, also in the 15th Scottish Division, who took some of you and attacked on the 26th of June, just a few archers away to the east of Joe's sector, in a thick mist. When Joe's battalion arrived in Shu in the late afternoon of the 26th, he realized the village already in ruins and flooded by the heavy rains, was far from secure. Moreover, the 49th West Riding Division on his right had failed to capture the Hohe Spur, overlooking the open ground across which the 8th Corps was to attack, meaning that the Highlanders were heading straight into the mouth of the SS guns. At 6.15 p.m., Joe's first assault towards graville sur odon in a gloomy atmosphere caused by the fading light, pouring rain and the stench of decaying cattle, was met by heavy machine gun fire. On their way to their start line for the attack, going down Rue des Portes and through Lot du Bosque, the Highlanders ran right into four Mark IV Panther tanks from the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend on reconnaissance. At 8 p.m. already, they were forced to retreat to the village, still under heavy mortar fire and occupied by occasional snipers hunting the farms and houses. Today, the Rue des Portes still shows evident signs of the battle. Such as bullet-ridden walls on this farm, which used to be a German hospital. A German soldier left some personal information on this stone, and the front door is heavily impacted with a piece of shrapnel still lodged in its wood. We are right in the middle of Shu, uh, which was completely destroyed at the time, now rebuilt. Joe and his comrades suffered a very long night of heavy shelling in their HQ near the church, which is right in front of me. And it's right next to Rue des Portes, where the attack was supposed to be launched the next morning. And during all that time, the stretcher bearers and drivers kept a continuous evacuation to the aid station right behind me under very testing conditions. This uh, Mark II British helmet, uh, which has a uh, Royal Army Medical Corps flash on the side and was camouflaged with sand and black paint, belonged to John Morris, um, one of the men in a mobile ambulance company that was attached to the units during the battle. Nothing is left today of the uh, HQ right here and uh, the aid station that was uh, heavily shelled during the battle and the bombings which uh, took place right after D-Day. Joe probably didn't sleep much that night. Still, he had to get up at 4.15 a.m. for breakfast as his unit was ordered in again on the 27th at 7 a.m. Spirits were very low as yesterday's attack made it clear that a renewed frontal assault along the same route was pointless and suicidal. Indeed, despite artillery preparations and support of Churchill tanks from the 7th Royal Tank Regiment, the 10th Highland Light Infantry was once again stopped near the same spot by heavy machine guns and mortars in front of the British start line. The Germans had prepared positions on the Salbe stream with four dug-in tanks from the 8th Company of the 12th SS Panzer Regiment, camouflaged behind thick hedgerows. According to their war diary, on the left of Rue des Portes, Joe's B Company, and I quote, had a really bad time. The battalion's commander was furious at his men, while his opponents 
SS Abstromführer Hans Siegel wrote. We arrived just in time as an infantry attack begins from the heights south of Schur. We let them come close and then hammer at short distance. Concentrated fire from four machine guns at the mass attackers who were anxiously firing bullets into the terrain without aiming. <laughs> Experience has shown that this tactic works and the result here is that they run back in panic under the salvos from our machine guns. We open fire from our panzer guns only on the tanks attacking with the second wave. Again, we achieve full success without losses of our own. The enemy crews bail out in panic from burning and exploding tanks. The rest of them turn away and with them the infantry who disappear behind the hills. We are in the German positions uh, facing the Highlanders Axis advance from Schö. Today it's only a 15 minute walk from their HQ to here. But although the fields remained unchanged for 77 years, the situation at the time was very different. Siegel had his four panzers uh, right behind me, uh, behind those hedgerows, and they had a clear field of fire. Uh, and, you know, the Highlanders were coming from a ridge called Point 100, named after its height, and were into open country uh, without any protection and they probably couldn't see the SS defenders until it was too late for them. So Siegel waited until he could see all the, the silhouettes uh, against the sky and he used all his tanks, machine guns uh, to fire all at once uh, on the Scots. Then they used their main guns to shoot at the British tanks supporting the infantry and of course it was a real massacre. British casualties were heavy with more than 30 Highlanders killed. It was another day of confused fighting, but the heroic action of an anti-tank platoon helped get rid of the Panthers which had infiltrated Le du Bosque in the morning, and Siegel's Panzer was destroyed by a Sherman tank while trying to escape through a field. The farmer who owns it still finds many relics of the battle. Dernièrement, on retrouve uh, par exemple le nécessaire, le car, uh, je pense, d'un soldat anglais Euh, fourchette, euh, cuillère, des couvercles par exemple de Sherman, euh, des tuiles de chenille, de char, pistolet lance-fusée, euh, enfin beaucoup de choses. Sans parler des obus, des grenades euh, qui, qui sont en monnaie courante chez nous. On n'a pas de mine, donc euh, c'est souvent des obus qui n'ont pas, qu pas explosé, donc avec un défaut. Ou... Donc pour l'instant, non, on n'a pas eu de soucis particuliers. Il y a quelques années, en labourant, j'ai retrouvé un casque, euh, un casque allemand avec le crâne dedans. Euh, euh, voilà, la, la mauvaise surprise. Mm. On appelle euh, la gendarmerie. Euh, donc la préfecture euh, vient, fait avec une poêle à frire euh, des recherches autour. Et puis, euh, dans, dans ce cas précis, euh, ils n'ont pas retrouvé la plaque euh, militaire. Donc euh, ils ont pris les ossements et puis, euh, puis voilà. Oui, je pense que ça remonte et on en a encore euh, pour quelques, quelques dizaines d'années, je pense. Ouais. While the tanks of the 11th Armored Division passed through the Scottish line to reach the Odon, pushing back the Germans in the process, the Highlanders buried their first dead. Now we are on the Scottish positions. Uh, it is here that Joe's B Company was torn to pieces. Um, right in front of me are the hedgerows where Siegel's tanks were concealed. Um, and coming here and studying the terrain, it's easy to understand how uh, they got ambushed and why they couldn't break through. So the Scots were pinned down and forced to withdraw to shoot behind me uh, by midday and any advance was impossible until uh, British tanks from the 11th Armoured um, were able to finally push back the Germans uh, all the way to Granville. But right here where the attack failed uh, is also the first burial site for the Scots killed on that day and for Joe, whose temporary grave was found right behind me uh, on the corner of that field, on that spot right here. Before they are moved to official military cemeteries, soldiers are very often buried where they fell. In fact, the locals I met all confirmed that hastily made crosses and rifles planted in the ground marked temporary graves at the edge of each field. Therefore, it is easy to think that Joe was killed at that moment and the official history book Campaign in Europe, the story of the 10th Battalion, the Highland Light Infantry, 
states that it was KIA in Shu on the 27th. However, according to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, the battalion's missing man file and the information gathered in James' letters, he was killed on the 28th. Therefore, we should consider the possibility that Joe was still alive at the end of the 27th, as he would only be posted as missing on the next day. The fact that some documents acknowledge the initial mistake is actually really interesting, but it doesn't solve the mystery. What is the actual date of his death, and will I ever get a definitive answer? This is just another example of how confusing a large-scale battle can be and how little value a single human life has in the midst of all this chaos. Nothing more than a small cog in the huge war machine. Of course, for Joe's loved ones, this is a completely different story. On June 28th, Joe's division was ordered to extend and consolidate the bridgehead across the Odon by securing two bridges and the area between them and the 49th West Riding Division in Roré. The 10th Highland Light Infantry was relieved from its positions in the southwestern outskirts of Shu by the King's Own Scottish borderers. Following the D89 road or Route de Shu towards Colville, Joe's Highlanders were halted by snipers shortly before reaching the South Day Stream. This is the spot where they found themselves under sniper fire. So um, they had to leave the road and cross these fields on the left uh, in the direction of Mouan. On their way to their new objective, they passed by a small bunker that was already silenced by another Scottish unit. The Germans captured there controlled all the communications in the area, all the way to Carpiquet airfield. Meanwhile, as the Glasgow Highlanders defending Colville were being attacked from Mouan, a small hamlet in the middle of the woods, about a thousand yards farther east, Joe's battalion was ordered to clear it with the support of Sherman tanks, lying between the Corville Bocage Road and the railway line, which doesn't exist anymore and is now the Highway A84. Mouan had been taken by mistake by the 3rd Montmanchur the night before because of a map reading error but had been soon retaken by the infamous 1st SS Panzer Division, Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler. In the dusk of the evening, at 7.45 p.m., under a heavy artillery barrage, Joe's battalion moved off to attack Mouan, marching through cornfields towards the railway line. While A and C companies advanced on the left, Joe's B company followed D on the right flank. At first, they met no opposition, but suddenly, the Highlanders faced a wall of machine gun fire at almost point-blank range from houses in front and from the railroad, sweeping the top of the corn and pinning the men down. The tanks had a rough time too, with four Sherman tanks knocked down by anti-tank guns and panzers. Still, a company on the left managed to destroy five enemy tanks, kill about 50 Germans, and reach their objective, the road railway bridge east of Moore. On the right flank, Joe's company, shortly before reaching a wooden area after they crossed the railroad, also came under the fire of snipers and the machine guns of two Panther tanks dug in in an orchard. Casualties were appalling. In his book Operation Epsom, Tim Saunders shares the point and testimony of Private Arkwright, 10th Highland Light Infantry, remembering the attack. They told us we could now get the SS buggers and take care of them. So we perked up a bit and got ready, and soon after that two sergeants led us off, carrying stents, and soon we went into the fields. There was some corn and a few bushes, and then we heard shouts and bangs, and we dashed forward, firing like mad and yelling our heads off. It was fantastic but terrible, as we saw all those bodies of our own chaps and Jerry's in brown camouflage jackets, some dead, some wounded, some firing or trying to get away. We showed no mercy at all. We fired in all directions and just wiped out the lot. We were so worked up into a rage. When we got through the first position, 
we soon came under fire from elsewhere, so we dug ourselves in. I felt completely worn out and all in a sweat, and I kept seeing all those poor jocks lying dead, and I felt sick and cried. It is very likely that Joe was among the many men that were killed in Mouan on the 28th, because this is the official date on his tombstone. So that means he would have been killed uh, right here in this field behind me, uh, just south of the railway line, uh, which is now a highway. The Highlanders' attack had failed, and the men withdrew to a sunken road, returning fire as best they could to evacuate the casualties from the field. They counted 25 killed, including three officers, 49 wounded men, and eight missing. As the bodies of the killed and those unaccounted for were abandoned in the battalion's retreat, Joe was most likely among them. A short time later, the 43rd Wessex Division carried out a successful attack, clearing Mouan for good. The family that still owns the same farm near which Joe was allegedly killed can testify to the desolation that reigned in Mouan in the wake of the fighting. There was no person in the farm, I don't know if it was the Germans or the English, the Germans who had evacuated the inhabitants. And my parents were arrived in August 1944 in this farm. I would say that there was no roof, there was no door, there was no door, there was no door, there were holes everywhere, there were buildings crumbled. Brûlé, oui, oui. Bon, ça avait été bombardé. Je me rappelle de, de mon père quand il avait des vêtements anglais. Il s'habillait avec des vêtements anglais. Hein, pour, ouais. euh, parce qu'il avait tout perdu, donc il s'habillait avec des vêtements qu'il retrouvait sur le terrain en 1944. Hein, ça, c'était 1944-1945. Hein. Et alors, juste après guerre, vous me parliez de, de tombes temporaires que vous retrouviez sur les bords des routes Alors, nous, mon frère, c'était dans les années 52-53, moi, dans les années 58. Euh, toutes les tombes avaient été relevées. Par contre, euh, c'était les soldats allemands qui les relevaient, oui, plus... sous la surveillance évidemment des, des Anglais. Hein. Les corps, évidemment, ils étaient en décomposition. Euh, quand ils euh, tiraient quelque, un gars, ben, ils s'en allaient en morceaux. Ils prenaient deux ou trois morceaux euh, qu'ils mettaient dans un cercueil et puis euh, le reste, ça restait sur place. Donc, Il en est nous, resté. dans les années 60, on retrouvait euh, des, des, des squelettes, des équipements. Euh, moi, je me souviens avoir trouvé des, des, des cuirs de chaussures, des, des brelages, des, des, brelages, brelages. des os, euh, enfin, des ossements de, de, de pauvres gars, enfin, euh, indifféremment anglais ou allemand, de toute façon. Euh. Mais la rue dans laquelle est la ferme, donc la rue McFarlane, elle est restée à peu près identique. Ah oui, pareil. Ah, C'est l'impasse du bassin, hein, la, la rue McFarlane, oui, elle est restée un peu pareille aussi, la rue McFarlane, ouais. sauf arrivée au niveau de la boîte chemin de fer, bon, bah là. Euh, C'est coupé. C'est coupé, c'est la 84. Hein. Et c'est dans, dans ce chemin, l'impasse du bassin, où il y a eu euh, beaucoup de, de, de morts. Hein. C'était surtout des enfants anglais. Ils étaient que blessés, ils avaient été écrasés par euh, les chars anglais. Euh. Chars allemands non, non, anglais. Anglais Ah oui, oui, anglais. D'accord. Ah oui, oui, anglais. Bah, dans la, dans la puis, pagaille. Et puis les gars, ils voyaient rien. Hein. Dans les chars, ils voyaient rien. Ouais. Le gars, il était sur, euh, dans le chemin, euh, blessé, et il essayait de se tirer, et puis euh, les, soldats, les, les, les chars euh, passaient dessus. Hein. Eventually, the 15th Scottish Division had secured the bridges on the Odon and held a corridor about a mile and a half wide, although it had a strong enemy presence on either flank. The area would be nicknamed the Scottish Corridor, from which the German panzers would prevent any further advance and launch several counter-attacks for weeks to come. In the first days of July, David Milchrist arrived in Malto, just south of Mouan. I believe that Mouan was a rest yes. area for the 43rd Wessex Division. Do, do you remember the village by any chance? No, my first contact with Germans was at Malto, mm -hmm. collecting prisoners. And it's quite an interesting um, fact. Uh, I was responsible for charging the um, three-tonner lorries with German prisoners of about 200 German prisoners lying like sardines at the railway station. And I, had, I was helped by the um, army red caps, the army police. And I had to post a policeman, an army red cap, on every lorry to stop my soldiers 
saying, have a cigarette, have some chocolate, because they were all convinced that they were going to be murdered. The propaganda said, if you are taken prisoner, you will be murdered by the English. And of course, they were all terrified. And if they, when I took them to um, an encampment for prisoners of war, they were very scared and told several set stories, interesting for intelligence, for British soldiers. So I had to guard every truck and forbid giving cigarettes. My, my sentiment was to give them a cigarette or give them some chocolate. They were soldiers, poor devils. They'd been happier in there on their farm in Bavaria or somewhere. But um, it's interesting that the British soldiers, having fought them, immediately were friendly. But during the, the, your first battle, you, you were uh, fighting against uh, SS troops, SS Panzer troops. Yes, uh, later have, on, yes. They have a horrible the 12th, reputation. Uh, the SS, they were um, in the army from 13 on. They were, they, they were terrible. Any SS regiment was terrible. There's awful crimes of killing Soviet prisoners. And it was unspeakable. But the Wehrmacht, a lot of enemy in Normandy, in the Bocage, the Battle of the Hages, a number were Russians who were only too pleased to be taken prisoner. So the ordinary German soldier was like us. But the SS were despicable, yeah. unforgivable. Yeah. When you talked to those prisoners, um, did you change your mind about them uh, or...? No, I loathed the Nazis. I detested the SS. But when I saw dead German soldiers, my troops would say if he was lying in a gutter full of flies and dead, They're yeah, bloody German, only one good German is a dead German. I used to say, look, that is not the way you talk about your prisoners. That young man will get his wife or his mother will get a telegram from Hitler. We regret to say that your son died gloriously in the battle in Normandy. So I tried to convince my soldiers not to be, if you took a prisoner, you treated him correctly. From a strategic point of view, Operation Epsom helped to focus the Germans' attention on the area and thus allow Allied breakthroughs elsewhere on the front. But it was a tactical failure and a human disaster. It would be called off on the 30th of June, to be followed by several operations to control the vicinity of Caen. Operation Jupiter started on July 10th and was supposed to gain control of the heights of Hill 112, southwest of Caen because it offered excellent views of the whole Norman countryside. A German commander said, He who holds Hill 112 holds Normandy. Consequently, both sides would suffer heavy losses for weeks, the hill changing hands several times, until the 53rd Welsh Division finally regained control of it on the 4th of August. The 4th Somerset Light Infantry, for example, suffered 556 casualties out of a strength of 845 on Hill 112 before David Milchrist was transferred to that unit. It would have taken almost two months to clear Caen and its suburbs, leaving the city completely ruined and thousands of civilian casualties. It was still a long way to Berlin, and in its first week of fighting, the 10th Highland Light Infantry, which was 800 men strong when it arrived in Normandy, had already lost 66 killed and 210 wounded. Joe was still posted as missing. His family was notified of the bad news by standard letter form. There's a, a parallel to uh, Joe's story because uh, your grandfather went missing as well. Yes, my grandfather went missing on the 7th of September 1944. After they pushed north from Lille, they were sent out uh, to take uh, the bank along the river and they got uh, a quick call from the headquarters to retreat that the Germans had dug in along, along the river. And sadly, my grandfather's uh, Lloyd Carrier breaks down from mechanical fault and he's caught behind enemy lines with the, the, the crew of that carrier. And his family received a, a letter? 
Yes, yes they did, yep. Uh, missing in action reports, yeah. I have it here. I regret to have to inform you that a report that has been received from the War Office to the effect that number 1433314 Private Frank Arthur Rosie of the Highland Light Infantry was posted as missing on the 7th of September 1944 while serving in Northwest Europe. The report that he is missing does not necessarily mean that he has been killed as he may be a prisoner of war or temporarily separated from his regiment. Official reports that men are prisoners of war take some time to reach this country, and if he has been captured by the enemy, it is probable that unofficial news will reach you first. In that case, I am to ask you to forward any postcards or letters received at once to this office, and it will be returned to you as soon as possible. Should any further official information be received, it will be at once communicated to you. I am, madam, your obedient servant. Yeah, we can really understand why uh, Joe's family uh, was also very optimistic about his possible return. Um because it gives a lot, of, a lot of hope to the family. Uh, well, of, of course, and you know, war is, is chaotic and soldiers well, went missing all that, the time. Well, that tells you on there, I mean, when, when did he get missing? <laughs> this, this letter is dated from the 22nd of September 1944. My grandfather went missing on the 7th. So there's already, you know, three uh, weeks three delay weeks. before yeah. they receive the letter. Yeah. You know, this is 27th of September 1944. They'd found him on the 9th. Yeah. <laughs> so it was reported missing uh, and she, long after he was found. Exactly, long after yeah. he was found. And, and more than that, I have several letters also um, that she had sent back and forth with the war office. She was terribly worried about her son. A letter from um, mid-October and a letter from early November where she still doesn't know if he's alive or dead or a prisoner of war. Yeah. So I think that the administration really didn't follow up the, the chaos of war at the time, you know. The, the most important thing was the men on the ground. Yeah. And sadly for like Joe's family, it took way too long for the family to find out that sadly he was killed. Yeah. And you know, this, it's still been shrouded in mystery to this day. But Frank did come home, unlike uh, Joe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like uh, to, to uh, come home after all this time? My mother's father, my grandfather, was a lovely man too. But he was very interested in the subject of war. And every time we used to go and visit when I was very young, um, he'd, he'd, say, he'd ask him questions. My dad would be, um, no, 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 no. He wouldn't, he, he'd be upset about it. But it came to the fact where my dad would never even visit the house in the future because of that reason, you know, my dad didn't want to talk about the war. It haunted him. It haunted him, yes. Um, and he drank a lot. He drank, he drank every night. To forget. To forget. And this probably gave him cancer. He got cancer in the stomach when he, when he got older and died at 67 years old. And I still miss him every day. And he died in 1993. And he's not one day goes by where I, where I, do, where I don't miss him, mm. honestly. He survived, but he carried on through life, forever changed by yeah. the horrors he saw and he the war that he really fought, was. as all the veterans did that came back yeah. from, you know. Later, Joe was temporarily buried on the side of a road just north of the village of granville sur odon with a few other men from the battalion killed near this crossroad in the failed attack of the 27th of June. Although it is possible that he was KIA that day in these fields, I believe that the date engraved on his tombstone is the right one and that he did survive to fight another day. Indeed, I have contacted experts at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission who replied that the date stated on the official casualty lists was provided to them by the military authorities. There must have been an official investigation at the time, but sadly, these files no longer exist, so I can only trust the results. But why was he found in a temporary grave in Chu if he was killed two kilometers away in Mouon? My theory is that his body might have been found in cornfields long after the fighting died down in the area and that he was laid to rest with his unit's comrades killed the day before, probably by civilians or German prisoners identifying his unit by his shoulder patches. It could explain why Joe stayed missing in action for many months. I couldn't help but ask David Milchrist what his opinion was on Joe's fate and why its details are still so blurry so many decades later. 
Well, the only answer I can give, the First World War, my father was um, a chaplain in Belgium, in France, for nearly three years. So he was burying the dead and writing letters to parents who'd lost their son or their husband or whatever it was. And my uncle, David, who was 18, was killed during the Battle of the Somme. He was blown to bits. The only reason I mention it because my my uncle David, this is why I'm called David, after him, was never found. And I was born in 24, and that was very soon after the First World War. So I was brought up in the effects of the First World War, which affected my father deeply because he spent three years as a chaplain burying and helping wounded soldiers. He didn't actually fight. So, um, your friend, what was one day in a war? The date is not important, yeah. Yeah. but if he was found, is now in these lovely cemeteries, which are like gardens with roses and things, whether it's the 27th or 28th, that's paperwork probably. Somebody you've got the wrong date or something like that. At that moment, I realized David was right. As long as Joe is remembered, the date actually does not matter anymore. Yet, it was the key to finding out what happened to him. Officially, Joe's status was only changed from missing to missing believed killed on July 31st, but as 1944 came to a close, his family was still waiting for news and still full of hope. James wrote on the 1st of January 1945. There is a chap who works with me who has a brother missing believed killed in France about the same time as our Joe, but today he got news from home that he was a prisoner but badly wounded. His people had written to the Red Cross, just as you did. The Red Cross also wrote them saying they regretted the delay in getting this news to them because the enemy was holding back his list, and it was only news of those who were badly wounded that they were allowing the Red Cross to have. So don't you see what this means? Not only is Joe safe, but he's also well. So I hope I can pass on to you the confidence which I feel about it all. From the beginning, I always felt that Joe was a prisoner, and now this seems to be a little bit of proof. So keep smiling. One day you will all know that I am right, and I'm sure it won't be long now. On the 30th of March, 1945, Joe's status finally changed from missing believed killed to killed in action probably when his temporary grave was found and his remains identified. In October, long after the sounds of battle had died down, Joe's body was dug up and reburied among 1,626 other Commonwealth soldiers at some of you war cemetery in Chu. A significant portion of the men buried there were killed during Operation Epson, and Joe and his fellow Highland Light Infantry soldiers killed near the town are placed right at the entrance of the cemetery. Joe never had a chance to go home. Surviving during the war was uh, uh, mostly a question of luck? Yes, mostly luck. Like life, the whole of life is short. I prefer the word chance. The fact that we are born is a chance. The fact that our parents had children is a chance. The fact that we were educated is a chance. The fact that you weren't killed is a chance. I was use the word chance more than luck. For example, when we in my battalion, not the regiment, the Fourth Somerset, captured the highest point in Normandy, Montpasso, and there's a stream which was our crossing line, our front line, and there was a mass of German schmeisers machine guns. And my company commander was um, trying to move forward with shots and badly wounded. Two of our stretcher bearers went out and they were shot. That was typically SS uh, sh shooting Red Cross with a, uh, a long iron stretcher. And we were stuck all day long. And eventually the colonel decided we were going to take Montpasson in the, in the night, and it, it was dark, and we took Montpasson in Indian file. 
platoon after platoon, and we arrived on the top, dug holes immediately. On our left were the Germans, on our right, and they didn't know we were there. It was quite extraordinary. After this horrible battle all day long against the machine guns and mines, we had to go get off the hill, having taken the hill, and there was a little pass with fox gloves on either side. And I was the last to leave with my batman. You always have a batman with you, a young man, about my age, 18 or 19. We heard a shell or a mortar coming. I ran to the, ran to the left, he ran to the right. It landed between us. When I came to, I hadn't a scratch on me. My batman had lost both his arms and died in my arms. That was horrible, horrible. Why I wasn't scratched, I can't think, and he was killed. So that upset me for several days, as you can imagine. He hit both his arms. To this day, I haven't found a letter from James describing his reaction to the news of Joe's death. But one thing is certain. For Joe's brothers and sister, who returned safely from the battlefields of the Second World War. Grief must have been a long journey, almost as exhausting as war itself. Martin is related to them, and I was lucky enough to talk to him during my research. We finally meet after... Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's been about a year, right, when you first contacted me. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it's great to finally meet you. My relationship is, um, I'm actually... Jimmy's stepson. The emails you sent to me has made me, you know, wish I'd asked Jimmy more questions about what happened to him. Uh, he didn't talk much about D-Day, only that he jumped over Normandy with his brother. They were together when they jumped. Um, and then he talked a little bit about the Battle of the Bulge because he was sent over there in, uh, in uh, Christmas. He was on leave in England, I think, and sent back. He also had was injured. He had a uh, a shrapnel mark on his chin. That was a close call then. Close call, yeah. It was the the shrapnel mark was here, right, in a cleft in his chin. Uh, that was all I ever heard about it. And then he talked about um, jumping over the Rhine, very little. And then in the talked more about the Far East. Actually, he remembers because after they jumped over the Rhine, they drove, I think, across Germany. Um, and then he was sent to um, by ship to the Far East to Singapore. And Malaysia, and then he was sent to um, Java and, uh, and Sumatra, and then he was demobbed in in Singapore, I think, and mm. and then came back to the the UK. Do you know what happened to Nat and uh, and to Betty uh, at the end of the war? Uh, Nat um, survived the war. Uh, he went out to uh, Indonesia with with Jimmy, and he um, died, I think, from cancer in about nineteen seventy. Five, I think he died. Betty um, m married an American serviceman, I think in okay. 1944, 1945, roughly around that period. She emigrated to America. Uh, they never, uh, certainly Jimmy never stayed in touch with her, or the family didn't seem to stay in touch with her. Um, but Jimmy knew about her son. Her son ended up fighting in the Viet Vietnam War in the 1970s. Uh, he may still be alive now. I don't know. We're, we're certainly not in touch. Do you know uh, how and, and when uh, they uh, actually learned uh, of Joe's death? At the beginning of 1945, on, on January 6th, um, there's a little notice in the Manchester Evening News um, which basically says... Um, it's Joe's birthday. We hope you come home soon. The family's missing you. So certainly at his birthday in 1945, they thought he was still alive. Hmm. So my bet is they didn't find out that he was dead until, or he passed away until after the war was over. I think all the time they were probably writing letters to the, the Ministry um, of War then, you know, what's happened, what's happened, what's happened. And again, too, I think through the fog of war, nobody knew, or certainly nobody communicated to the family that he was, um, he passed away. 
they never talked about it after the war. Uh, they never talked about Joe. He only ever talked once about Joe that I remember. Maybe he did more, but all he remember him saying was that, yeah, his brother died in the war. And that was it. No, no detail, nothing, you know? So it was one, I think still quite even, this would have been in the 60s, maybe 60s, 70s. And even then it was still painful for him. Joe was the first son, the, the apple of the family's eye. He was certainly um, well liked and well respected as a, a son and a, a brother. And I still think it was painful for them to, to talk about it. Do you know if they ever visited his grave? No. And my, again, one of my regrets is that I never took Jimmy to Ronville or to see his brother's grave. They never went back. Jimmy never asked to go. It's almost like it was better to put that into a, a safe box, you know, where you don't have to think about it. Um, interestingly, my sister can't watch your documentary. Oh, yeah. She watched it for, I think, 10 minutes and stopped. She, mm. she finds the memories painful. And looking at the, uh, the, the pictures and probably the, some of the pain that he went through. Based on, on what you, you've seen uh, in the film, um, what is your opinion on the circumstances of Joe's death? He just became another unknown soldier. And honestly, until you, your documentary came and remained very much an unknown soldier for the last 80 years. Not a hero, not a, a Superman, just an ordinary soldier doing his job. It wasn't the Montgomery's of this world or the De Gaulle's of this world or, you know, even the Rommel's of this world. It was just the ordinary soldier. The single soldier like Joe who loses his life in um, in the midst of a massive battle where lots of other soldiers lost their lives, those were the people who ended the war, not anybody else. The rest get the glory. The ordinary soldiers just took the pain and the anguish and the, and the sorrow and the pity. Yeah, it's true. And, and do you think that we do enough to remember them? World War II was probably one of the few times that there was a reason to go to war. Um, many people think it, they should have gone to war earlier. There is the, you know, the phrase that they died that, so that we can live. And I think for World War II, that's probably very true. It's almost the one war that I can justify to myself, you know. And I think that their sacrifice means that we have to understand how important it is to prevent other wars. You know, it was something they didn't want to do, but had to do to keep us free and to keep us safe. And I think one of the things that we mustn't ever forget is those people, those ordinary soldiers who gave their lives in Normandy or in El Alamein or in Singapore, in all the battles across World War Two. Do you think that in a few decades uh, they will all be forgotten forever? I think that they will be remembered in the way that we remember the people from the First World War. Their memories have been forgotten. What we're left with are the, the military battles, the military um, explanations of what happened. We're not left with the, the soldiers' experience unless they wrote it down, but most didn't. Um, but I think what your documentary does is bring him back to life again. I think you called it the missing Highlander. Mm -hmm. You could almost call it the forgotten Highlander. Because until you did the documentary, he was forgotten. Mm. And now he will live as long as your documentary lives. But uh, that's one of the great things about um, memory that it can be kept alive but it needs work back in 2017 british veteran albert fig a former artilleryman in the 43rd wessex division who helped build the hill 112 memorial 
told me just a month before he died. It's good that young people like you are interested in what we've done. You need to talk to your children and grandchildren about it, so that we are not forgotten. The British Memorial at Versailles, inaugurated on June 6, 2021, has a splendid view over Gold Beach and the remnants of the artificial port of Aromanche. On its columns are listed all the names of the British soldiers killed in Normandy. Joe's name is among them, and he appears as being killed on the 28th. However, his name is missing on the plaque by the Church of Mouen probably because the list was based on the battalion's history. Between 1939 and 1945, 12 million men and women served in the Commonwealth's forces, including 5.9 million in the United Kingdom. Because 70% of Allied forces on the ground in Western Europe were American, the British soldier's role in the victory is often overlooked. Nevertheless, he took part in all of the campaigns of the six years of the war and counted no less than 384,000 dead. Joe is only one of them. And I'm encouraging each of you to do your part in honoring those who gave it all for our freedom. How many Joes have disappeared without a trace? How many heroic tales will never be told? How many more souls will be lost in a terrible waste that is war? On Joe's birthday in 1946, his grieving mother would leave a heartbreaking message in the newspapers. Loving birthday memories of Joe, the dearly loved eldest son of Jean and the late Nathaniel Hewitt, killed in action in Northwest Europe June the 28th in 1944. Too dearly loved and missed, ever to be forgotten, mother.